The House with the Brick Kiln by E. F. Benson The hamlet of Trevor Major lies very lonely and sequestered in a hollow below the north side of the South Downs that stretched westward from Lewes and run parallel with the coast. It is a hamlet of some three or four dozen inconsiderable houses and cottages, much girt about with trees. But the big Norman church and the manor house, which stands a little outside the village, are evidence of a more conspicuous past. This latter, except for a tenancy of rather less than three weeks, now four years ago, has stood unoccupied since the summer of 1896. And though it could be taken at a rent almost comically small, it is highly improbable that either of its last tenants, even if times were very bad, would think of passing a night in it again. For myself, I was one of the tenants. I would far prefer living in a workhouse to inhabiting those low-pitched oak-panelled rooms, and would sooner look from my garret windows onto the squalor and grime of Whitechapel, than from the diamond-shaped and leaded panes of the manor of Trevor Major onto the boskage of its cool thickets and the glimmering of its clear chalk streams where the quick trout glance among the waving water-weeds and over the chalk and gravel of its sliding rapids. It was the news of these trouts that led Jack Singleton and myself to take the house for the month between mid-May and mid-June. But as I have already mentioned, a short three weeks was all the time we passed thither, and we had more than a week of our tenancy yet unexpired when we left the place, though on the very last afternoon we enjoyed the finest dry fly fishing that has ever fallen to my lot. Singleton had originally seen the advertisement of the house in a Sussex paper, with the statement that there was good dry fly fishing belonging to it. But it was with but faint hopes of the reality of the dry fly fishing that he went down to look at the place, since we had before this so often inspected depopulated ditches which were offered to the unwary under high sounding titles. Yet after a half hour's stroll by the stream, we went straight back to the agents and before nightfall had taken it for a month with option of renewal. We arrived accordingly from town at about five o'clock on a cloudless afternoon in May, and through the mists of horror that now stand between me and the remembrance of what occurred later. I cannot forget the exquisite loveliness of the impression then conveyed. The garden it is true, it appeared to have been for years untended. Weeds half choked the gravel paths, and the flower beds were a congestion of mingled wild and cultivated vegetations. It was set in a wall of mellowed brick, in which snapdragon and stone crop had found an anchorage to their liking. And beyond that, there stood sentinel, a ring of ancient pines in which the breeze made music as of a distant sea. Outside that, the ground sloped slightly downwards in a bank covered with a jungle of wild rose to the stream that ran round three sides of the garden, and then followed a meandering course through the two big fields which lay towards the village. Over all this, we had fishing rights, 
above, the same rights extended for another quarter of a mile, to the arched bridge over which there crossed the road which led to the house. In this field above the house on the fourth side, where the ground had been embanked to carry the road, stood a brick kiln in a ruinous state. A shallow pit, long overgrown with tall grasses and wild field flowers, showed where the clay had been dug. The house itself was long and narrow. Entering, you passed direct into a square panelled hall, on the left of which was the dining room which communicated with the passage leading to the kitchen and offices. On the right of the hall were two excellent sitting rooms looking out, the one on the gravel in front of the house, the other onto the garden. From the first of these you could see, through the gap in the pines by which the road approached the house, the brick kiln of which I have already spoken. An oak staircase went up from the hall and round its ran a gallery onto which the three principal bedrooms opened. These were commensurate with the dining room and the two sitting rooms below. From this gallery there led a long narrow passage shut off from the rest of the house by the red baize door, which led to a couple of more guest rooms and the servants' quarters. Jack Singleton and I share the same flat in town, and we had sent down in the morning Franklin and his wife, two old and valued servants, to get things ready at Trevor Major, and procure help from the village to look after the house. And Mrs. Franklin, with a stout comfortable face, all wreathed in smiles, opened the door to us. She had had some previous experience of the comfortable quarters, which go with fishing, and had come down prepared for the worst, but found it all of the best. The kitchen boiler was not furred, hot and cold water was laid on in the most convenient fashion, and could be obtained from taps that neither stuck nor leaked. Her husband, it appeared, had gone into the village to buy a few ne necessaries, and she brought up tea for us, and then went upstairs to the two rooms over the dining room and the bigger sitting room, which we had chosen for our bedrooms to unpack. The doors of these were exactly opposite one another to right and left of the gallery, and Jack, who chose the bedroom above the sitting room, had thus a smaller room, above the second sitting room, unoccupied, next his and opening out from it. We had a couple of hours fishing before dinner, each of us catching three or four brace of trout, and came back in the dusk to the house. Franklin had returned from the village from his errand, reported that he had got a woman to come in to do housework in the mornings, and mentioned that our arrival had seemed to arouse a good deal of interest. The reason f for this was obscure. He could only tell us that he, had qu he was questioned a dozen times as to whether we really intended to live in the house, and his assurance that we did produced silence and a shaking of heads. But the country folk of Sussex are notable for their silence and chronic attitude of disapproval, and we put this down to local idiosyncrasy. The evening was exquisitely warm, and after dinner we pulled out a couple of basket chairs onto the gravel by the front door and sat for an hour or so. While the night deepened in throbs of gathering darkness, the moon was not risen, and the ring of pines cut off much of the pale starlight. So that when we went in, allured by the shining of the lamp in the sitting room, 
it was curiously dark for a clear night in May. And at the moment of stepping from the darkness into the cheerfulness of the lighted house, I had a sudden sensation to which, during the next fortnight, I became almost accustomed of there being something unseen and unheard and dreadful near me. In spite of the warmth, I felt myself shiver, and concluded instantly that I had sat out of doors long enough, and without mentioning it to Jack, followed him into the smaller sitting room in which we had scarcely yet set foot. It, like the hall, was oak panelled, and in the panels hung some half dozen of watercolour sketches, which we examined idly at first, and then with growing interest. They were executed with extraordinary finish and delicacy, and each represented some aspect of the house or garden. Here, you looked up the gap in the fir trees into a crimson sunset. Here, the garden, trim and carefully tended, dozed beneath some languid summer noon. Here, an angry reef of storm cloud brooded over the meadow, where the trout stream ran grey and laden below a threatening sky, while another, the most careful and arresting of all, was a study of the brick kiln. In this, alone of them all, was there a human figure? A man dressed in grey peered into the open door from which issued a fierce red glow. The figure was painted with miniature-like elaboration. The face was in profile, and represented a youngish man, clean-shaven, with a long, aquiline nose and singularly square chin. The sketch was long and narrow in shape, and the chimney of the kiln appeared against a dark sky. From it, there issued a thin stream of grey smoke. Jack looked at this with attention. What a horrible picture, he said, and how beautifully painted. I feel as if it meant something as if it was a representation of something that happens, not a mere sketch. By Jove! He broke off suddenly and went in turn to each other of the other pictures. That's a queer thing, he said. See if you notice what I mean. With the brick kiln rather vividly impressed on my mind, it was not difficult to see what he had noticed. In each of the pictures, appeared the brick kiln, chimney and all, now seen faintly between trees, now in full view, and in each the chimney was smoking. And the odd part is that from the garden side you can't really see the kiln at all, observed Jack. It's hidden by the house, and yet the artist, F.A., as I see by his signature, puts it in just the same. What do you make of that? I asked. Nothing. I suppose he had a fancy for brick kilns. Let's have a game of pickets. A fortnight of our three weeks passed without incident, except that again and again, the curious feeling of something dreadful being close at hand was present in my mind. In a way, as I said, I got used to it, but on the other hand, the feeling itself seemed to gain in potency. Once, just at the end of the fortnight, I mentioned it to Jack. Well, odd you should speak of it, he said, because I felt the same. When do you feel it? Do you feel it now, for instance? We were again sitting out after dinner 
and as he spoke, I felt it with far greater intensity than ever before. And at the same moment, the house door, which had been closed, though probably not latched, swung gently open, letting out a shaft of light from the hall, and as gently swung to again, as if something had stealthily entered. Yes, I said, I felt it then. I only feel it in the evening. It was rather bad that time. Jack was silent a moment. A funny thing, the door opening and shutting like that, he said. Let's go indoors. We got up, and I remembered seeing at that moment that the windows of my bedroom were lit. Mrs. Franklin probably was making things ready for the night. Simultaneously, as we crossed the gravel, there came from just inside the house the sound of a hurried footstep on the stairs. And entering, we found Mrs. Franklin in the hall, looking rather white and startled. Anything wrong? I asked. She took two or three quick breaths before she answered. No, sir, she said. At least, nothing that I can give an account of. I was tidying up in your room, and I thought you came in. But there was nobody, and it gave me a turn. I left my candle there. I must go up for it. I waited in the hall a moment, while she again ascended the stairs, and passed along the gallery to my room. At the door, which I could see was open, she paused, not entering. What is the matter? I asked from below. I, I left the candle alight, she said. And it's gone out. Jack laughed. <laughs> and you left the door and window open, said he. Yes, sir. But not a breath of wind is stirring, said Mrs. Franklin, rather faintly. This was true. And yet a few moments ago the heavy hall door had swung open and back again. Jack ran upstairs. We'll brave the dark together, Mrs. Franklin, he said. He went into my room and I heard the sound of a match struck. Then through the open door came the light of the rekindled candle and simultaneously I heard a bell ring in the servants' quarters. In a moment came steps, and Franklin appeared. What bell was that? I asked. Mr. Jack's bedroom, sir, he said. I felt there was a marked atmosphere of nerves about, for which there was really no adequate cause. All that had happened, of a disturbing nature, was that Mrs. Franklin had thought I had come into my bedroom, and had been startled by finding I had not. She had then left the candle in a draught, and it had been blown out. As for a bell ringing, that, even if it had happened, was a very innocuous proceeding. Mouse on the wire, I said. Mr. Jack is in my room this moment, lighting Mrs. Franklin's candle for her. Jack came down at this juncture, and we went into the sitting room. But Franklin apparently was not satisfied, for we heard him in the room above us, which was Jack's bedroom, moving about with his slow and rather pondering tread.
then his steps seemed to pass into the bedroom adjoining, and we heard no more. I remember feeling hugely sleepy that night, and went to bed earlier than usual. To pass rather a broken night with stretches of dreamless sleep, interspersed with startled awakenings, in which I passed very suddenly into complete consciousness. Sometimes the house was absolutely be still, and the only sound to be heard was the sighing of the night breeze outside in the pines. But sometimes the place seemed full of muffled movements, and once I could have sworn that the handle of my door turned. That required verification, and I lit my candle but found that my ears must have played me false. Yet even as I stood there, I thought I heard steps just outside. And with a considerable qualm, I must confess, I opened the door and looked out. But the gallery was quite empty, and the house quite still. Then from Jack's room opposite, I heard a sound that was somehow comforting. The snorts of the snorer. And I went back to bed and slept again. And when next I woke, morning was already breaking in red lines on the horizon. And the sense of trouble had been with me ever since I last evening had gone. Heavy rain set in after lunch next day and as I had arrears of letter-writing to do, and the water was soon both muddy and rising, I came home alone about five, leaving Jack still sanguine by the stream, and worked for a couple of hours sitting at a writing table in the room overlooking the gravel at the front of the house, where hung the watercolours. By seven I had finished, and just as I got up to light candles, since it was already dusk, I saw, as I thought, Jack's figure emerge from the bushes that bordered the path to the stream, onto the space in front of the house. Then, instantaneously, and with a sudden queer sinking of the heart, quite unaccountable, I saw that it was not Jack at all, but a stranger. He was only some six yards from the window, and after pausing there a moment, he came close up to the window, so that his face nearly touched the glass, looking intently at me. In the light from the freshly kindled candles, I could distinguish his features with great clearness, but though as far as I knew, I had never seen him before. There was something familiar about both his face and figure. He appeared to smile at me, but the smile was one of inscrutable evil and malevolence, and immediately he walked on, straight towards the house door opposite him, and out of sight of the sitting room window. Now, little though I liked the look of the man, he was, as I have said, familiar to my eye and I went out into the hall, since he was clearly coming to the front door. To open it to him and learn his business, so without waiting for him to ring, I opened it. Feeling sure I should find him on the step, 
Instead, I looked out into the empty gravel sweep, the heavy falling rain, the thick dusk, and even as I looked, I felt something that I could not see push by me through the half-opened door and pass into the house. And the stairs creaked, and a moment after, a bell rang. Franklin is the quickest man to answer a bell I have ever seen, and next instant he passed me going upstairs. He tapped at Jack's door, entered, and then came down again. Mr. Jack's still out, sir? he asked. Yes, his bell ringing again. Yes, sir, said Franklin, quite imperturbably. I went back into the sitting room, and soon Franklin brought a lamp. He put it on the table above, which hung the careful and curious picture of the brick kill. And then with sudden horror, I saw why the stranger on the gravel outside had been so familiar to me. In all respects, he resembled the figure that peered into the kiln. It was more than the resemblance. It was an identity. And what had happened to this man who had inscrutably and evilly smiled at me? And what had pushed him through the half-closed door? At that moment, I saw the face of fear. My mouth went dry, and I heard my heart leaping and cracking in my throat. That face was only turned on me for a moment, and then away again. But I knew it to be the genuine thing, not apprehension, not foreboding, not a feeling of being startled, but fear, cold fear. And though nothing had occurred to assuage the fear of it, past and a certain sort of reason usurped, for so. I must say, its place. I had certainly seen somebody on the gravel outside the house. I had supposed he was going to the front door. I had opened it, and found he had not come to the front door. Or, and once again, the terror resurged. Had the invisible pushing thing that which I had seen outside and if so, what was it? And how can it that the face and figure of the man I had seen were the same as those which were so scrupulously painted in the picture of the brick kiln? I set myself to argue down the fear for which there was no more foundation than this. This and the repetition of the ringing bell, and my belief is that I did so. I told myself, till I believe it, that a man, a human man, had been walking across the gravel outside, and that he had not come to the front door, but had gone, as he might easily have done, up the drive into the high road. I told myself that it was mere fancy that was the cause of the belief that something had pushed him by me. And as for the ringing of the bell, I said to myself, as was true, that this had happened before, and I must ask the reader to believe also that I argued these things away, and looked no longer on the face of fear itself. I was not comfortable, but I fell short of being terrified. I sat down again by the window, looking onto the gravel in front of the house and finding another letter that asked, though it did not demand an answer, proceeded to occupy myself with it. Straight in front led the drive through the gap in the pines, and passed through the field 
where lay the brick kiln. In a pause of page turning, I looked up and saw something unusual about it. At the same moment, an unusual smell came to my nostril. What I saw was smoke coming out of the chimney of the kiln. What I smelt was the odour of roasting meat. The wind, such as there was, set from the kiln to the house. But as far as I knew, the smell of roast meat probably came from the kitchen where dinner, so I supposed, was cooking. I had to tell myself this. I wanted reassurance, lest the face of fear should look whitely on me again. Then there came a crisp step on the gravel, a rattle at the front door, and Jack came in. Good spot, he said. You gave up too soon. And he went straight to the table above, which hung the picture of the man at the brick kiln, and looked at it. Then there was silence. And eventually I spoke, for I wanted to know one thing. Seen anybody? I asked. Yes, why do you ask? Because I have also, the man in the picture. Jack came and sat down near me. It's a ghost, you know, he said. He came down from to the river about dusk and stood near me for an hour. At first I thought he was, was real, and I warned him that he had better stand farther off if he didn't want to be hooked. And then it struck me he wasn't real. And I cast, well, right through him, and about seven, he walked up towards the house. Were you frightened? No, it was so tremendously interesting. So you saw him here too? Whereabouts? Just outside. I think he's in the house now. Jack looked around. Did you see him come in? He asked. No, but I felt him. There's another queer thing too. The chimney of the brick kiln is smoking. Jack looked out at the window. It was nearly dark, but the wreathing smoke could just be seen. So it is, he said. Fat, greasy smoke. I think I'll go up and see what's, what's on. Come to? I think not, I said. Are you frightened? It isn't worthwhile. Besides, it is so tremendously interesting. Jack came back from his little expedition, still interested. He had found nothing stirring at the kill. Though it was then nearly dark, the interior was faintly luminous, and against the black of the sky he could see a wisp of thick white smoke floating northwards. But for the rest of the evening we neither heard nor saw anything of abnormal import, and the next day ran a course of undisturbed hours. And suddenly a hellish Activity was manifested. That night, while I was undressing for bed, I heard a bell ring furiously, and I thought I heard the shout also. I guess where the ring came from, since Franklin and his wife had long ago gone to bed, and went straight to Jack's room. But as I tapped at the door, I heard his voice from inside calling loud to me. Take care, it said. He's close to the door. A sudden qualm of blank fear took hold of me. 
but mastering it as best I could, I opened the door to enter. And once again, something pushed softly beside me. Though I saw nothing, Jack was standing by his bed, half undressed. I saw him wipe his forehead with the back of his hand. He's been here again, he said. I was standing just here a minute ago when I found him close by me. He came out of the inner room, I think. Did you see what he had in his hand? I saw nothing. It was a knife. A great long carving knife. Do you mind my sleeping on the sofa in your room tonight? I got an awful turn then. There was another thing too. All around the edge of his clothes, at his collar and at his wrists, were little flames playing. Little white licking flames. But next day again, we never heard nor saw anything, nor that night did the sense of that dreadful presence in the house come to us. And then came the last day. We had been out till it was dark, and as I said, had a wonderful day among the fish. On reaching home, we sat together in the sitting room, when suddenly from overhead came a tread of feet. A violent pealing of the bell, and a moment after yell after yell as of someone in mortal agony. The thought occurred to both of us that this might be Mrs. Franklin in terror of some fearful sight. And together, we rushed up and sprang into Jack's bedroom. The doorway into the room beyond was open, and just inside it, we saw the man bending over some dark, huddled object. Though the room was dark, we could see him perfectly, for a light stale and impure seemed to come from him. He had again a long knife in his hand, and as we entered, he was wiping it on the mass of that lay at his feet. Then he took it up, and we saw what it was. A woman with head nearly severed. But it was not Mrs. Franklin, and the whole thing vanished. And we were standing, looking into a dark and empty room. We went downstairs without a word. It was not till we were both in the sitting room below that Jack spoke. And he takes her to the brick kiln, he said rather unsteadily. I say, have you had enough of this house? I have. There is hell in it. About a week later, Jack put into my hand a guidebook to Sussex open at the description of Trevor Major. And I read, Just outside the village stands the picturesque manor house, once the home of the artist and notorious murderer, Francis Adam. It was here he killed his wife in a fit. It is believed of groundless jealousy, cutting her throat and disposing of her remains by burning them in a brick kiln. Certain charred fragments found six months afterwards led to his arrest and execution. So, I prefer to leave the house with the brick kiln and the pictures signed F.A. to others.